unlike the Marathas, the Jats did not try to form an empire. They remained content with a kingdom that extended from Agra to Mathura. It was a small ter territory and therefore it depended on very heavy revenue collection apart from other things. The next one, what we have is the Rahillas. In Rahilla Khand, with headquarter at Vedili. Actually, this was the home of the Katehar Rajputs, who came earlier from the east, particularly from the Banaras region, but they created problems for the Mughal Empire, and the Mughals from the middle of the 17th century began to settle the Rohillas immigrating from Afghanistan. By the middle of 18th century, the Rohillas had driven away the Rajputs into the countryside and had started their own kingdom, whose last Nawab was Hafiz Rahmat Khan. Hafiz Rahmat Khan died in 1774 at the hands of Nawab Abaud and the British in a combined attack. And Rahil Khan passed under Abad. In 1801, Rahil Khan was given to the English by a treaty by the Nawab of Awadh. But the Rahilas were not interested in making an empire. They remained content with uh, very good horsemen, some peasants working with the land and with their own customs. And despite the problem of the Rajputs, they were not communal in that sense. They allowed the Rajputs to have their religious ceremonies, even build their own temples. In case of the Sikhs, we have a problem. The problem is of the Afghan Sikh struggle from the late 17th and early 18th century. But the Sikh principal problem was that it has a very strong sense of social equality. And at the same time, there was a very uh, distinct urge from the lower castes to come up. The revolt of Banda Bahadur in early 18th century shows this clearly, fought by the Jat warrior peasants on his behalf, Although he was advised to some extent by upper class Hindus and supported with money by Khatris. But the Sikhs had a major contradiction. The contradiction is that on the one hand some of their leaders wanted to be the Nawabs of the Zamindas with plenty of land like Kapoor Singh of Patiala who became Nawab. But they have a very strong sense of social equality forged by ideology. Actually, this contradiction prevented them to form a state earlier, and it was only in the late 18th century and early 19th century that Ranjit Singh could form the state in which he included the Rajput ceremonies. Then we come to Tipu Sultan, which was almost a different kind of a state. Hyder Ali uh, had been able to chalk out a, to curve out a kingdom for Mysore, extend it to a certain extent, which was further extended by Tipu Sultan. This had given alarm to both Nizam and the Marathas, and they had combined along with the English to destroy the kingdom of Mysore. Hyder Ali was not in favor of the Jamidars, although the Jamidars were there, but he took away their 10% discount, which they used to get, and he started his own collection machinery of the revenue. 
in case of Tipu Sultan, he practically cancelled the Jamindars altogether. So there was an internal structural problem or changes in case of both Hadar and Tipu. But Tipu's case was different because of certain other factors. Tipu was the one who had brought the European, particularly the French, to train up the army, not like uh, Mahadaji Sindhya of using the French army, but training the French army, manufacturing cannons and ammunitions, even manufacturing glasses, mirrors, and so on and so forth, all with the help of the French. The other thing was that, like the English, Tipu Sultan started his own trading, state trading mission. The factories were established in different parts of India, as well as outside India, in West Asia. These factories were run by the council set up for the purpose, and they used to mainly trade in silk, which became the most prominent commodity. But Tipu Sultan and uh, Hyder Ali's Mysore did not last long. Tipu was first defeated in 1793 by Cornwallis with the help of Nizam and the Marathas, and finally was killed in 1799 by uh, Wellesley, once again with the help of the Marathas and the Nizam. Only the Marathas did not understand that their term would come, their confrontation would come within another five years. Now, Tipu Sultan's Mysore is a different case, which shows that the states of successor states of 18th century had all their different problems, their different uh, ways of meeting those problems, had different features. In case of the third force that we have mentioned, the English East India Company, there is practically a one-way traffic, one would say. Till 1757, the English were bringing bullion, money from overseas, to purchase goods, which they were sending to Europe. After 1757, gradually this was stopped. And the, one of the major problems of this system was that the English were always short of cash supply and they were always trying to find out how to get the cash. They could take the loan, but the interest was very high, and the directors would not approve of it. So therefore, Clive thought of a solution. In 1765, he got the Diwani after winning the Battle of Baksar in 1764. He got the Diwani of Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, and now began the English uh, trade with force, with military power, with diplomacy sometimes. But the, that will not solve like exactly the investment problem of the English. One of the reasons was that this revenue was increasing. It had become doubled within five years. It has become uh, almost two crores jump in last 50 years, but that was not enough. That was not enough to make the purchase which was increasing. Earlier there was the purchase of spices and cloth, particularly high value cloth. Now the purchase was saltpeter, opium, and raw silk and what is known as calico, the coarse cloth. This calico was a necessity for the English in the sense 
that this calico or this coarse cloth was used in America for slave trade. The slaves were given this calico and it is for this purpose it is the Indians who are supplying this calico to them. Now, but even this trade was continuing, one would need money. Revenue is not enough, it comes to twice, in certain cases thrice a year. And the revenue has increased from 1722, during the time of Murshid Kuli Khan, of 1 crore 10 lakhs to 3 crore 30 lakh by 1770. There were famines, of course, in Bengal, terrible famines of 1769. But the English did not relent, they continued. So therefore the English were thinking of certain other terms of getting money. And there were two methods which they found. One method was the tribute from the different states. Some of the states were annexed. They were annexed much later, but they were under control of the British and they had to pay money. For example, in 1793, after the third battle of Mysore, Anglo-Mysore War, Cornwallis forced Tipu Sultan to pay 3 crore 30 lakh rupees in cash, which he paid. And he, at the same time, he took away one-third of Mysore. In case of Awadh, they had to pay 80 lakh of rupees per year as subsidy for keeping the English troops in Awadh for the protection of Awadh. This was later changed, reduced to 60 lakhs. But then, in 1801, they took away, by treaty, Allahabad and Rohilkhand. So, the this kind of technique was not enough. Even Warren Hastings had tried to get money from Chait Singh, Raja Chait Singh of Benares. Not much money, but even then he tried to force it. So there were always the attempts to get the money from the states as much as possible, which is called in Mughal terms as Peshkash. The third met method of the English East India Company was that sending the profit to England of the official merchants in their unofficial and according to some illegal private commercial ventures. Most officials, if not all, were involved in private trading. As we all know, that in 1717, Farukshir has given a farman to the English East India Company that after paying 3,000 rupees a year, they would do free trade. It's not clear whether in Bengal or the whole of India. But the English thought, or rather interpreted, that this was applicable to whole of India and that this was uh, applicable to the private commercial ventures of the officials as well. One of the American historians of recent days, Holden Farber, had estimated that between 1780 to 1790, these officials had sent to England through foreign channel, of course, through French, to Dutch, to through Dens, etc. About 10 lakh 80,000 pounds a year, every year. So this was what is known as the drain of wealth from India. And this drain of wealth coincided with what is known as the forced marketing. Earlier, England used to purchase cloth and they used to bring bullion for the purchase. Now, there is no question of bringing bullion, bringing any money. 
Now they are buying only the raw materials. They are not allowing the Indian artisans to do anything. The raw material is being sent to England, transformed into finished goods in British machine, which is the Industrial Revolution. And then these are brought into India to be sold in the market. So the entire structure of the Indian economy, of the economy of British India, had completely changed by the end of the 18th century. The results could be seen from the report of Lord Cornwallis in 1790. He said that so much money and goods in raw material were going out that there was total stoppage of agriculture. Agriculture is dwindling. There is an Indian writer, Gulam Hussain Tabatabai, who wrote from Murshidabad around 1780. He was pro-English, of course, that the artisans are not doing anything nowadays. They have no jobs. The entire market is dislocated. The entire artisanal group have no job. Agriculture is not flourishing. It was a terrible condition for the Indians. Now, this condition that we see has been seen in a different way by some other historians. One of them was let Athar Ali, who had given certain arguments for a new thesis that has not yet been very properly discussed. In an article published in Modern Asian Studies, he had pointed out several aspects. We may point out one or two. According to him, the British were bringing money, that is all right, till 1757. But they were taking away the goods. And the taking away these goods changed into the taking away of the raw materials to England, in which England had flourished. There were the markets of England. There were the artisans coming up. There were the urbanization, new urban areas coming up. And this was possible because so much of goods, practically the entire goods, had gone to England. That is one of the effects of the English domination. The second one, he said, that because of this dislocation of the markets, the luxury goods are not available in India in nowadays. That is in the second half of the 18th century. And it is because of this, the high nobles were in great difficulties because their lifestyle is not being maintained. Their aspirations are not being maintained. The prices of luxury goods had gone very high. Their income had not increased. There was a crisis in the agriculture. And therefore, they tried to oppress the peasants to get more money leading to peasant revolts, and they tried their own internal intrigues and faction fighting, which uh, led to the decline of the empire itself. The third result of this, or rather the reason of the result is, that in case of Asia, Arthur Ali sees the decline of the three empires, three Islamic empires at the same time. Persia, Turkey, and the Mughals. As a matter of fact, he also sees the breakdown of the Uzbek Khanates, who are also Islamic, at the same time. Now, what are the reasons behind? Why all these three simultaneously decline? these Asian countries did not use 
what is known as the science and technology. While Europe was advancing in technology, they are making research in technology, there are higher research on science. In India, there is no such venture. Even the Canon manufacturer had remained a cottage industry in India. And he cited the improved arms of Nadesha, who got his victory at the Battle of Karnal in 1739 against a large number of Mughal forces because of the superior caliber of their rifles firing on the back of the camels. Now, this kind of lack of interest was not all through there in Mughal India. Akbar was one of those who not only invented new machines, but he also improved some of the old machines. But his interest was not pursued. The nobles were not interested. No one was interested to pursue what he had done. And it remained as a neglected part of the Mughal Empire. Nothing was done. For example, there was no watch. There is no binocular. There is no other musket lock rifle and things like that. Now, these are not found in Persian literature also at all. One of the 18th century leaders, Jai Singh, he constructed an observatory as a matter of fact, one at Banaras and another at Delhi. And he had utilized, he said in his book, utilized the Europeans to bring certain equipments, etc. But it was a model. The model was discarded in Europe long back. It was a model that was followed in 12th century Arabian literature in which he had followed, although it is true that he had good connection with European missionaries and asked them to bring some of these equipments. In his book, there is no mention of Newton, for example. So therefore, in the Persian literature of the times, there are many Hindus who are writing in Persian also, but there is no interest, so to speak, on what is known as the science and technology. Therefore, in case of 18th century India, on the one hand we find the decline of the centralized Mughal Empire, then at the same time we find the rise of the successor states, with their different portfolios, with their different agendas, their different internal revenue, etc. And we find the domination of the English East India Company, particularly in Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, which forced the Indians to go it into abject poverty. And lastly, we see the failure of the Indians, which is a cul cultural failure, according to Arthur Ali, to adapt improvements in science and technology in the Indian context. So the 18th century, as has been said by Charles Dickens, with which I have started, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Thank you. <laughs>